Hi, this is Terry, and now we're working on Chapter 13. In our traditional income statement, we're going to have sales minus cost of goods sold is gross margin minus our operating expenses is net income. And what we want to do is build that a little bit uh, more to say that this is net income from continuing operations, from continuing operations, then we'll take away our taxes, and then we'll get a net income before these three items. So we'll continue the D, E, and C, and that's just a little acronym that I use so I remember them because not only is it the right order, but of course it's the short version for December. So we have three sections that we separate out because if we put these three sections up here as expenses, then what it will do is by looking at how well the company's doing and any of these three items, any or all these three items exist, it's going to distort the real picture of what's happening in operation and it's going to distort how well people can predict the future as to how well the companies are, are how well people can <laughs> investors looking will be able to predict the future of what the company is going to do. Sorry there. The first thing is discontinued operation and there's a lot of costs that are involved so let's say that you're making you know digital watches which in the 70 was quite the rage because they were so cheap but of course now that we're in the new millennium nobody is going to go buy those so to take a, a, an operation a, a part of our company and just close it up or to discontinue making that product uh, and to discontinue those facilities is, is quite expensive to put that in as an expense in the current time period then would distort what's really happening so that discontinued uh, operations goes down below in the lower section of our income statement so investors don't include it. The second thing is extraordinary items and they have to be infrequent and unusual. They have to meet those two classifications. So if you had a hurricane in the Gulf Coast, that would not be extraordinary because it happens all the time. If you had a hurricane in Illinois, uh, which would be impossible because of the land mass and it wouldn't be a hurricane, it would be a tornado, but those kind of items um, would be extraordinary and should be recorded down here separately in the extraordinary section. So if you had a uh, uh, fire in a factory and it's it's infrequent and it's unusual that it would happen then that factory <coughs> excuse me <coughs> that factory fire would go uh, all the expenses that are incurred because of that would go down in this expense and the third section is the cumulative effect on an accounting change so you may have decided that you want to switch from FIFO to LIFO. Well, if a company does that, they can. They have to report it with the SEC. They have to put, produce the financial statements for three years um, under both methods, the old method and the new, and they can't change for seven years. But the effect of the difference between using the FIFO method and the LIFO method then goes down here in the, in the cumulative change of an accounting uh, cumulative effect of an accounting change. An interesting thing to note is that with this DEC it's all done net of taxes. So you would figure out what the gross amount is, you would deduct any tax implications, whether it's a tax savings, so if you have a profit and then you have to pay taxes on it, you would put in the net value, or if this is a loss, but then it's a tax deductible loss, then what you're looking at is the, excuse me, is the cash flow value, so we just say net of taxes. The next item here is deferred taxes and probably the easiest thing to do is to talk about acres and makers first. Prior to 19, 1980 
um, everything was done on the double decline in straight line method for uh, calculating depreciation. And part of Reaganomics was they wanted to get people back to work. Well, the way they did it was they turned around and said, okay, let's say that we have uh, an asset that's going to have a useful life of 12 years. Well, what we're going to do is let you depreciate that over five years. The issue then becomes that if a company wants depreciation after five years, the only way they could get it is if, if they went out and bought new equipment. And for them to buy new equipment means that somebody had to make the equipment and people were then put back to work. So in, in when this was passed in 1980, it was seen as a long-term fix to our economics. Of course, companies want huge depreciations. They want to record that depreciation expense and the accumulated depreciation that huge expense then lowers their net income they pay less taxes and depreciation expense does not use cash so companies love to have high depreciation uh, because it doesn't affect affect their flow of cash and it, it actually helps their flow of cash because then they don't have to pay taxes so it becomes what's called a tax shield which is an word you'll need to know for the statement of cash flows. All right. Um, it was such a good deal, but it was too good a deal in the Tax Reform Act of 1986. Then they turned around and said, well, instead of making it five years, for example, let's, let's make it seven years. So it's just as good, you know, it, it's still a good deal. It's better than 12 years. It's just not as good of a deal as what it was. Where does this come into play? Well, it's the concept of deferred taxes. What you'll do in deferred taxes is you'll take the difference between financial and uh, tax purposes, and when you go to record that depreciation expense and the accumulated depreciation, the uh, amount of money that you don't have to pay the government based on the tax um, calculations then goes into a deferred taxes. Um, the deferred taxes then is a long-term liability if you're on the credits, credit side of the deferred taxes. It becomes a long-term asset then if it's on the debit side. So what we want to know at this level of accounting is that those deferred taxes are going to be the difference between financial accounting and our government accounting or uh, what, you know, what we have to pay on our uh, taxes at the end of the year. Ultimately, if we go back to our little timeline and let's say seven years and ten years, you're going to be putting little amounts into, into that deferred tax liability and keep putting the differences in. And then after, some, uh, after an asset is fully depreciated and you do not go out and buy another piece of equipment that you just hold on to it, then slowly but surely all the remaining years you're going to take those little pieces out of here and ultimately at the end of these 12 years then there will be no difference between the uh, no difference between the deferred taxes, you know, the financial and the uh, tax accounting. It's a very complicated subject. It gets very involved. It's hard to explain. Uh, unless you're CPA bound, you, you probably want to just stay away from it, other than the fact that understanding that tax, the definition of it is that it's, it's a long-term liability. All right. Earnings per share, the basics earnings per share, is that you're going to take net income and divide it by the number of shares of common stock, so the number of shares of common stock that's outstanding. Remember that we authorize, we issue, right, and then we have outstanding and treasury. So this is the number of shares that are outstanding. So it's the number of of shares of stock issued less the treasury. What happens with fully diluted earnings per share is that we may issue preferred stock that's convertible. So our preferred stock that's convertible. 
and we may have something like a 20 to 1 ratio that for every uh, share of preferred stock, the, the uh, person buying the stock could convert it into 20 shares of common. We also sell bonds payable, and we may give a conversion feature to that. And the issue becomes on our income statement, if we're going to give the earnings per share, what we have to also do if we're in a complex capital structure that we have these conversion features, what we have to do is give the fully diluted earnings per share. And the difference between that, and if I get rid of my red marks here, the difference between it is it's going to be net income but it's not only going to be just the number of shares of common stock of common stock but it would be all the other shares if everybody exercised those features so if everybody turned around and converted their preferred stock to common and their bond payable to common stock then how many additional shares would that be? In other words, it's the worst case scenario. So if you provide the number of shares that you know that you have and then add to the denominator how many possible shares, then you get the fully diluted earnings per share, which is the worst case scenario earnings per share. And you simply uh, display both of them. So earnings per share might be $2.98 earnings per share on, on a basic structure and then the fully diluted might be you know $1.57 earnings per share. And since you don't know whether people are going to exercise those rights by just giving the worst case scenario, now the the investor knows what the worst case scenario is, then they can make their own decision as to whether or not to buy buy into the company. All right, the next section here, the statement of stockholders' equity. Um, I just threw an image down here at the bottom, and it's not meant for you to really read it uh, per se. The print's really small. But the idea is that you show your preferred stock, your common stock, your paid in capital, you know, all the other items that would be listed, other categories that would be listed, treasury stock, etc. You'd put that all into your um all the different sections of your owner's equity, and then you simply show all the major changes from the beginning of the period to the ending. So you have the uh this particular uh, problem was February 28, 2003 to through uh, November 30, 2006, whatever the time frame is. So the uh, statement of stockholders' equity just shows the beginning balance in a table format, the ending balances, and then all the major changes that happened in each one of those sections. And again, it's, it just gives a picture of, of what's happening to equity over a given period of time. Okay, next one is the next topic is stock dividends versus cash dividends. And when we do a cash dividends, then what we do is debit dividends and dividends payable. So at that point in time, we've reduced our owner's equity by by declaring dividends. Dividends, the contra owner's equity account, and dividends payable is our liability. Then later, when we actually pay those dividends, we take the dividends payable off the books and record cash. So the liability then goes down, so these two cancel each other out, and our asset cash goes down. Well, sometimes instead of giving a cash dividend, what you want to do is give a stock dividend. And a stock dividend is different because no cash is involved. So if we look at our contributed capital and retained earnings, all we're doing with stock dividend is we're taking retained earnings and purchasing shares of stock and distributing that to our investors. So if you look at a stock dividend, what's the overall effect on owner's equity? And the answer is nothing. We're just taking it from one subcategory and putting it into another. 
no different than put it, you know, taking it from your right pocket and put it in your left pocket. You still have the same amount of money on you. It's just in a different pocket. And that's what's happening here. So what we would have to do is we would uh, do a debit to stock dividend declared and then we would put it into common stock and then we have to put it into a special temporary account called common stock distributable because if we would have the end of a financial period right after that point in time we, that stock has not actually been distributed because there's a, a data record and the date of distribution to this. So we put it in common stock distributable. Common stock distributable. Then later, when we actually distribute the stock, then we take it out of the distributable and make it just plain old common stock. So at this point here, this stock dividend gets closed to retained earnings which is how we take the money out of retained earnings and put it into common stock. It just flows through this stock dividend temporary account. Again, it's just like dividends, but this becomes, instead of a cash dividend, it's a stock dividend. It's a reduction of owner's equity, specifically in, uh, gets close to the retained earnings account. A stock split, and I'll move, remove the red here, a stock split is just a journal entry and the idea here is oftentimes a stock price will start at one level so let's say it's fifty dollars and it keeps climbing it keeps climbing it keeps climbing all of a sudden that stock price is five hundred dollars well if the company wants to be competitive and wants to to you know retain that that market of people that five hundred dollars has gotten out of most people's price range so what they'll do is say alright we'll have a stock split so we'll have a ten to one split so now that ten to one split gets converted back that if you had one share that was had grown and was worth five hundred now you have ten shares that are with worth fifty so one times five hundred is five hundred dollars and ten times fifty dollar par value is going to be five hundred so what you do is you increase the number of shares from one to ten but decrease the par value from five hundred down to fifty and it's all done at this ten to one ratio so there is no change in the overall equity there's no change right it, it doesn't change the overall value it just changes the number of shares and the par value so if you had five hundred dollars worth of stock before the stock dividend or before the stock split then you have five hundred dollars worth of stock after the stock split um, why do companies do that? Again, it makes it more reachable now. The price is back down to $50 that more people can invest in it. Um, it usually is seen as a good sign in the market, and so all of a sudden the stock, stock, price, stock price starts to go up immediately because of that stock split. Um, again, it's, it's just a tool uh, of trying to attract investors and retain investors. So the very last item here is what is changes in total equity due to a stock split or a stock dividend? And the answer is none. There's, there's no overall change. It's just internally there's a different makeup. All right? Thanks.